do that now. And then also just a reminder that we've, again, are using a lot of material from the book Unselfie by Michelle Borba. So if you don't have the book and you're interested, definitely check that out. So, so we're going to talk a lot about perspective taking today. Now I'll go ahead and get started because I think it's such a, it's a really, really interesting and important topic. Like how do we teach empathy without perspective taking? It's really kind of inherent in the idea of empathy in general. And so I wanted to kind of share something that I know that all parents struggle with. Um, as an example of why perspective taking is so important. And that is, if you have more than one child in your house, um, like we do at home, inevitably there are going to be arguments that just erupt, especially if your kids are a similar age. And so I was thinking about this and I was thinking that so often in our house, I can start to hear out of my, out of the side of you know, my ears, like, oh, here goes something in the front room, right? And sometimes it doesn't erupt, you know, in a huge way. Sometimes it does. And what we find ourselves a lot doing, and I'm going to let someone in right now, um, is the first thing is each child often has their own explanation for why they did something, right? And they seem very, very convinced that they are the right ones, right? They're doing it for the right reasons. They reacted because they had to react. And what I often say right away is, okay, I want both of you to explain to each other why you did the things you do. Now, I'm not saying we do this every time, but they both need to understand. And as Jamie's going to talk about, we're going to talk about together today, the key here with perspective taking is to think you don't have to agree with the other person's decision, right? You may, it may have been the wrong one, whatever. But I need you to see, and this is kind of the key line often, can you see why that person got frustrated? Can you see why Will, Lewis, whoever, one of my kids, whatever, can you see why he or she might have gotten frustrated? Because if you can't see it, then again, without this perspective taking, you're probably going to have a hard time regulating and understanding your own emotional state in the first place, right? So, so I'm going to kind of launch and let Jamie take over here initially, just thinking kind of, you can kind of hold that example in your mind as we go through and uh, we'll go from there. All right. So I asked Dr. Schrader to try to think of an example from his family. One, because he does have several kids and I have zero kids. So this, I feel like is, he probably experiences more regularly, but I also think this is something I personally have a hard time with at times, especially when I am in a heightened emotional state. So as I'm reading through this and I'm thinking, you know, this idea of truly trying to at least understand where someone is coming from, we live in kind of these echo chambers, not only in our social world, but in our political world, in our, you know, broadly in the way that, you know, our electronic communication and news and media and all of these things, kind of the things we like, we get echoed back to us, um, Facebook algorithms and all of these things. So it can be really hard um, for us to reach outside of that and just listen and accept that others don't necessarily see things the same way that we do. And again, I can kind of self-admit that that's hard for me, not only just um, in the broad sense, but even in my own personal relationships. So um, it's, I think, something that we take, take advantage of or take for granted that there are other people out there who think differently. And in fact, they are often in our own families. So as Jim said, we've started with these building blocks of like what emotions are, how do I know what I'm feeling when I'm feeling it, and why am I doing the things I do? What are the values and beliefs that I have, and how do my actions align with those? And the last piece that Dr. Borba really talks about is we need to teach our kids how and when to apply these skills in relation to other people. So they have a moral identity, they have emotional literacy, but how does that affect our relationships with others? And this is this idea of perspective taking. We wanna teach our kids to understand the world from someone else's view, to allow for that deep connection, that caring connection, that even when I don't agree with you, your perspective is still important. So when I do hurt your feelings or I do violate a value, I can see where you're coming from, right? It kind of helps us build that bridge. And as, yeah, go ahead, Jim. I say, and one of the things we see when you look at kids who have early social deficits from whatever domain is that they struggle exactly with this, right? We call this actually theory of mind, but they struggle with this idea of perspective taking. It's, it's even critical as, you know, kids are toddlers and preschoolers, how important this is to develop there. And so we see it in a lot of different domains. We realize, wow, this is really like, again, the fabric kind of the underpinning of a lot of our social world there, so... 
I actually was talking to a friend last night and she brought up this idea that her son is really struggling right now with accident versus not an accident. Um, and that I, I think I, we see this on the playground probably every day. Teachers are like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, I run into someone when I'm playing soccer with them. Okay. Am I taking immediate offense to that? Or were we all just running around and, you know, he was running and I was running and we accidentally bumped into each other. Um, and then when that conflict arises and my feelings are hurt because physically I'm hurt, that kid's feelings are hurt. Physically he's hurt. Can we come together and see that it was an accident or am I going to assume that it was intentional? So, um, as we spoke about, I think Jim brought this up the very first session, this idea that we don't have to agree. I don't have to think that your reasoning is correct. We all have a different opinion, but that I'm committed to listening to show you that I care enough to hear your reason, right? To hear why you did what you did or why you feel the way you feel. Um, and so this really develops through two different modalities. The first one is how we're modeling this idea for our kids. And then the other way is really teaching them the skills. When we think about um, just approaching it from a modeling perspective, kids can watch what we're doing and they can see how we respond to their wrongdoings or misdeeds or accidents. But if we're not teaching them and showing them what we do and why, they're maybe only going to pick up on part of this. And I was thinking about this, Jamie, that many times if you live in a significant other in your house, kids are kind of watching how two people agree to disagree or don't agree to disagree, right? They really watch to think, oh, okay, so when, you know, you know, the two, two um, just leaders of the house are kind of there, like, so when they disagree, is that done in a respectful way? Do they seem to try to understand the other person's opinion, vice versa, right? I mean, there's really a sense of this idea that I think when you're talking about modeling, it often starts with just the adult relationships in the home and how we go about like navigating differing opinions, which of course we can't get away from. That's always going to happen. So um, there's other ways that we can model this, but I think it definitely starts in the home many times. So. Yeah. And again, from my own relationship, I can see this happening all the time, right? What are the emotional reactions that I choose to pursue and share and talk through and why this violates? And when are the times when I'm like, I'm upset we're not opening that can of worms. And when are we going to come together to have a mutual understanding of, of the situation? Um, so a lot of times these experiences where we can really identify an opportunity to show and model this idea of perspective taking is when our kids make a mistake. So with this, we come to the idea of discipline and it's important that we acknowledge that there are so many different reasons why parents choose to engage in different discipline practices. And my goal here is not to say, you know, your way of disciplining your children is wrong or incorrect. Research shows us that there are certain ways and things that are more effective. Um, but more broadly, I'm not talking about your kid hits another kid. How are we going to approach that? Right. We all know hitting is not a good choice and a parent may choose to address that however they want. Same thing with, you know, throwing a vase and crash, smashing it on the floor, right? Those are more big, aggressive behaviors. And that's not really what we're talking about here. What I, what I will more want to talk about is these like day-to-day, -day, like mean, uncaring, emotional things. Like you set a limit on your teenager and they stomp up the stairs and slam their door. Clearly, you know, from my seat, at least that's probably a pretty just emotional response. You told them, no, they're upset. They're really emotional about it. Or you have two, your two young kids are arguing with each other. Um, and one of them snatches the toy out of the other one's hand. Okay. That's a, probably an emotional response. They're both pretty upset. They both wanted the same toy. Um, and so a lot of times our initial response is to treat these issues as behavioral. So to say you get a consequence for taking the toy from your brother or for storming away from your parent. Um, you may yell at your kid. Some families choose physical punishment like spanking or even time out can really be um, a parent's go-to in those situations. And again, we're not going to talk about the pros and cons of those, except to say that when you engage in those types of disciplinary actions in a situation that is usually driven by emotion, we lose out on a huge opportunity to engage in this idea of inductive discipline. And to add to kind of a, even a further thought, 
<laughs> I think each family has to have, excuse me, <clears throat> a threshold by which certain behaviors go beyond what they're they're willing to accept, right? So if you think about this idea, like we were talking about, if situations get really aggressive or destructive or whatever, you may still have to, there's some teaching that can come from that, but you have to leverage oftentimes a punishment or consequence. And, you know, again, those aren't the ones we're talking as much about, but it is the key here to think about that idea that when those situations are more emotional, what a great opportunity. Now, I know that we did, again, I was a parent myself, we don't think of this as an opportunity, but look, it's kind of like, imagine that they messed up in the reading homework or their math homework, and they made some mistakes in doing that. When we go forward to help kids making mistakes academically, you know, we don't leverage a punishment per se, unless it's really egregious or whatever. But I think oftentimes, and I, I'm, I, this is a fault of mine too at times, when situations become emotional, we do think of more of a behavioral kind of reaction to it, not like, oh, you know what? They're still developing this emotional literacy and I've got to figure out a good way of helping them do this. So I, I think, it, you know, as we talk about this perspective taking today, it's a really big, important distinction. It's not always easy, but worth kind of mentioning. Yeah. And I think building off of what Jim is saying here, that when we're teaching this skill, again, the goal is to build empathy. The goal is not to say that you're never going to have an emotional reaction or say something mean or stomp away. I mean, I'm 29 and I still sometimes want to stomp away and slam the door, right? It's more about how I am bridging that gap with my partner or my mom or whoever it is in the moment to at least kind of have that underlying care and compassion and, and empathy for not just the people who I know very well, but the people that I don't know very well. Um, so the way that when we engage or treat these highly emotional or highly, yeah, highly emotional situations, if we treat them more kind of clinical, non-compliant behavioral way, we either model to our kids this poor emotional response, like engaging in yelling or hitting, spanking. And we also um, can increase feelings of isolation and rejection. When kids are very highly um, in a highly charged emotional situation, actually research shows that they need more close time and care. And when we treat that highly emotional situation with rejection and isolation, we can decrease their ability to deal with these big feelings in the future. And that's the opposite of what we want. We want a big feeling to trigger a response of, okay, something inside me is not aligning. My feelings and my values don't align with my behavior. How am I going to work with another person to deal with this issue? So Jamie, I want to, I want to kind of extend this at a lower age because we certainly do agree that it, sometimes if our kids have a tantrum or whatever, and they throw themselves on the floor, sometimes, you know, just allowing them to be there for a little bit to calm down, not pay attention is a good thing, you know, not to kind of remove that attention. So we're not, we want to be clear. We're not saying that that can in and of itself be a good, you know, systematic ignoring technique, but like what you are saying is that when we leverage those punishments in a very strong way, it's as if we're saying to our kids, you're not allowed to feel that feeling. And I, I want to offer the parents kind of listening today. There's three questions I always ask kids when we start off here um, and I'm working with families. And the three questions are very simple. One, are you allowed to have the feelings that you have? And most kids pretty quickly kind of understand, like, I think he's saying it's okay, right? But that it's, we want kids to be able to have the feelings they have, that anyone that tries to shift or tell them they can't feel that way, it's not a healthy thing to do that, right? Two, are you allowed to have your own thoughts and ideas, even if they're different than the people around you, right? Even if they're different, your parents are going to try to teach you important things. And again, we want kids to say, yeah, it's appropriate to have my own thoughts and ideas, right? It's really the third question. Are you allowed to do whatever you want based on how you think and feel that we're, you know, that's the behavioral concern. That's the domain we're not really as focused on, but we want to make sure that those first two things are validated. And what we actually, it's interesting, my research um, years ago when I was in graduate school, I looked at children's ability as college students now to take on like college tasks related to what we call like psychological autonomy, like how well they could think on their own related to how they were parented, the better they could think on their own and critically think and understand their feelings and everything else the better they were able to take on college tasks, but the more that they didn't know what to do with their own thoughts and feelings and take the perspective of others, 
the more they struggle with that. So I don't know if that helps, but when you think about, it, hey, we want your kids to know you can feel and have your own thoughts, but let's think about where that takes you sometimes, you know, if you're not being um, empathetic there. So essentially this idea of inductive discipline is that you're trying to help your kids imagine how they would feel if they were the recipient of the behavior. So if you said no to your child and they screamed at you, you take a moment, let the feeling kind of decrease in intensity. If the kid is screaming and yelling and we try to go, Hey, let's try to imagine how I feel right now. I don't know how well that would go over, especially depending on how old they are. But if you can kind of work with them to one, use a coping skill or a calming strategy to name the feeling and address the feeling and cope with that feeling in the moment, then you can kind of highlight the distress of the other person. And again, the way you do this, you kind of maybe need to be a little creative. If you ask a teenager, how do you think I feel right now while they're screaming and yelling at you? I think most parents would agree that's not going to end very well. But if afterwards you say, again, with these building blocks of emotional literacy, the moral values that your family has, and you say, let's talk through the situation. I could tell you were feeling angry, frustrated, annoyed, and I was feeling disappointed in your behavior. How do you think I, you know, you would feel if I screamed at you that way, you might, or your friend screamed at you that way. Um, you can kind of call attention to the behavior and explain why it was uncaring, but without an aggressive or kind of, um, without coming across, like you're trying to provide a consequence for that in a non-threatening way, maybe. Something we've done in our house, Jamie, that I think is exactly what you're describing is let's say a kid, one of our children gets angry and kind of rises up emotionally, right? You know, we, we would quick, quick to kind of say, Hey, so, and so did, now that that's not respectful when you're doing that. Do you recognize, you know, how that's coming across? It's kind of saying, okay, take the perspective of us. That seems kind of disrespectful there. Again, there's no consequence being levied or whatever, but I want you to recognize that. Is there something you need to tell us? If you need to, you need to say it probably a different way. Let's think about how you're feeling. And so the key is that we're trying to draw attention like you described to what's occurring and how they're feeling. But in those situations, not necessarily like having a punishment because that right away when punishments come on board, what we would say is that kids really focus much less on what you say and more of what you're doing. And I think that's a key idea here is that sometimes you got to have a punishment. But remember, whenever you use that, the things that you say that are aligned with the punishment are probably going to be consumed a whole lot less there. Right. And so this idea, again, is more so that you can help them repair the hurt, right? So I'm not saying that you have to, you can't take back the behavior, but you know, when you snatch the toy away from your brother, he felt really sad and we need to work on what you're going to do to help him feel better. So maybe you do need to share the toy, or maybe it's your turn to play with a different toy now, or maybe we take all the toys away and you guys play a different game together some kind of age appropriate way to genuinely kind of repair this offense. Now, this isn't to say that we are responsible for other people's feelings. You don't want kids to have that burden like, oh, anytime someone's upset, it's my fault and I bear that burden of their their feeling, but rather helping them understand that their action and their feeling did have an effect on others. And just so that they can see Hmm, I don't like it when other people talk to me that way. Maybe I shouldn't talk to them that way either. Maybe when I'm feeling angry or hurt or I want the toy, there's a different you know, choice I can make instead. Um, and then really, again, talking about how, how it was uncaring and how it has affected others. <clears throat> it, it's a fine line. And I think that it's, it's, again, like we've talked about this whole time, not an easy cut and dry in this situation, say this or don't say that. But you just kind of want to draw attention to the fact that their behavior does not exist in a bubble and other people are affected by it, even when they feel that it was justified or warranted because of their feelings and values. Yeah, it's kind of like I was mentioning at the beginning, that example about when our kids start arguing and kind of the line, can you see why so-and-so got frustrated? Could you see why you know, he felt like you were taking advantage of him? And, it, and the question is, not so much do you agree or do you even completely completely understand, but could you at least see a little bit of why 
you know, that person may have reacted that way. And I think of it, Jamie, almost in a visual way. It's easy for us to feel like we are our own selves, our own, you know, ball of emotions and thoughts that really just kind of contain itself in a bubble. But it's really like the visual of that, that emotional state rising across, you know, the surface to another person. And then frankly, you know, kind of uh, almost like cascading throughout the home, because we all know that these things not dealt with appropriately and understood from multiple perspectives change the mood of the house a lot and they can change it long term. And that's what we're trying to avoid in many ways. So, Right. So <clears throat> the way that we would want to practice this idea is to help kind of coach your kids through your own process as you're doing it. So when you're talking to your kids about this and you want them to talk to you or other kids in the same way, the first thing we want to do is make sure that our body language and our tone are very neutral. So even when, even if the child did something that was really hurtful and you feel disappointed in their action, you don't want to use a lighthearted tone because this is serious. You don't want to use an angry or aggressive tone either. You kind of want to keep it as neutral as possible, firm, but kind. Um, and really showing them, you know, in, in psychology, we learn these things early on of how to kind of like pull someone in with your body language and your eye contact and your nonverbals, you know, you don't want to be moving all around, but, you know, nodding or being really calm and gentle with your body, um, getting down on their level and really echoing this idea of emotion identification. So I can see that when you were playing with your brother, you got very frustrated. Is that how you were feeling? I can see that. Imagine if you were playing and someone took your toy away, how would, do you think you'd feel? Oh, yep. I think you would feel very annoyed. I, I understand that. So when you took the toy away from your brother, he got really annoyed, you know, so kind of like getting down on their level, using the age appropriate language. And then be sure that you're kind of modeling for them that idea of like using the feeling words, linking it back to the values and morals that your family has and um, validate that what your child was feeling in that moment is real. Like, like Jim said, we want them to understand that feeling angry is normal. Everybody feels angry when we hit other people because we're angry, that's where we run into problems. So there's a difference between being angry and hitting people and, you know, kind of walking them through that by saying when you hit others, other people are affected by that behavior. When you're angry and you use a cool down strategy or you walk away, you know, other people don't have the same, you know, effect or impact by that. So kind of this idea of tuning in to others, including your kids, when they're in those highly emotional states to model for them, you're trying to take their perspective why they got so upset in the first place or had whatever emotional reaction that they did have. Yeah. And I think at all of this, one of the neat things about it, and, you know, again, giving grace to all of us as parents, because sometimes you don't have the energy or the time to do this. And so as we're talking about this, recognize that we don't want you and nor can any of us emotionally coach all throughout the day, but it's kind of like seeing the situations that are available and using them. But, you know, I'll talk from personal experience that, despite all the effort required with what Jamie and we're describing. But the neat thing is, as your kids get older and they think in an empathetic way, even if they don't act on it, right? And they think in a perspective taking way, your relationships with them are, are so much better than I think a lot of parents feel with their kids, right? And so, um, you know, we all as parents need something that feels good on the back end after all the effort. And I, I just find that like with my own kids as they have gotten older, they know that these domains that we're talking about are always fair game. And they recognize that even if they have a need or desire that's really strong, they still have to consider other people. And it just, um, it just kind of makes things much richer in that domain there. And again, a lot of times when, when we're doing our practice here, we say it's really hard to do a new skill when you're in any kind of heightened state, right? So we always suggest practice deep breathing when you're calm, so that way, when you're upset or anxious, it works better. You can use it immediately, automatically. It's the same thing in this, in these situations, as Jim was saying, I don't expect you to go home. And the first time your kid and you have an argument that you're able to do all of these steps, it's just, but a lot of times, and 
Dr. Borba always has so many great suggestions and hopefully you're seeing a lot of those in the handouts that we're sending of how to practically start doing these things in more of a fun, creative way with your kids. So it becomes more natural, like incorporating that feelings, vocabulary, having these conversations about values and morals. So even things like having a family game night where you try to guess each other's emotions. I have these emotion dice that I made and it literally just has animals on one side and feelings on the other. And we roll them and kids have to pretend to be like an afraid chicken. And it's really fun and silly ways for them to kind of get this, kind of get these creative juices flowing. You can even do things like, I wonder how you would feel in this situation, or you can play games like that. We even do exercises in, in sessions sometimes where we have people literally sit in opposite chairs and say, okay, mom, now you're going to be daughter and daughter, you're going to be mom. And you have to literally pretend to be each other, including what you guys would think and say, you can do that at home too. Okay. Now, you know, Jane, you're going to be Bobby and Bobby, you're going to be Jane. Now, what was Jane thinking? How was she feeling? How do you know that? And why, you know, um, those I, there's so many creative solutions for these things, arts and crafts wise, you can use again, real life events, books, movies, all the media that your kids consume and, and talking through that, you know, bedtime stories are always great to teach these kinds of skills too. So, so I feel like in pop culture too, like I'm thinking back to Disney movies and things, there's always some kind of like grave misunderstanding, right? He did this to me and I didn't understand the full background. And now there's, you know, all this plot behind it. That's like the opportunity to pause the movie and say, okay, this guy clearly didn't understand really where that guy was coming from. What do you think could have been different if they talked about it or they had empathy for the other one, things like that. So as with all of these things, we know that it's not reasonable to expect you to do all of them. I wouldn't expect myself to do all of them, but just really thinking about what's going to meet and kind of align with your family's values, especially as we move in the next week or so, or in the next week to kind of that next step up on the pyramid in part two of the series, um, in that book. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And the last thought is again, I think households that really value perspective taking are increasingly healthy households. And I would say communities that value perspective taking are really much more healthy communities. So, you know, you think beyond even the kids being in your home as they go out and they grow up getting jobs and doing all sorts of things. It is an incredible skill when we meet those who clearly do a good job with perspective taking. We see it in our students. We see it in our coworkers. And so if anything, you know, it's not just a legacy you're leaving in your house, but it's a legacy we're leaving for our kids to take forward. And that's a, a great thing. So, but, um, well, Jamie, anything else before we let them go at our given time? I don't think so. I think, like I said, next week, we'll be starting kind of talking more about how the actual practice of empathy might look in your kids and how you can really work with them, um, off of these building blocks. So, yeah, we're really looking forward to seeing you all again next Wednesday. Thanks. Hope everybody has a great week. See you. See you guys.